The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us for another Concrete Ontario webinar. Today's topic is uh, SPIF compliance for ready-mix trucks. There have been numerous uh, questions from members over the last few months about SPIF permits, their costs, and how it's all going to work. So uh, what better way to, to address any concerns that members have than to uh, have the Ministry of Transportation provide an overview? Uh, today we have Joe Lynch here from the MTO, um, and Joe will be uh, addressing any questions that members may have. Now, my name is Alan Carey. I'm the Director of Technical Services um, at Concrete Ontario, and I will be your facilitator today. Um, I just quickly want to take a second to uh, recognize and thank our corporate sponsors for their ongoing support. So thank you to uh, London Machinery, Mac, BSF, and uh, Euclid Chemical. In terms of uh, housekeeping, as always, uh, this will be approximately a 45-minute webinar, and uh, we'll have questions and answers at the end. All participants are muted and uh, will remain that way for the entire webinar. If you do have a question, please use the GoToWebinar questions pane on the right side of your screen and type in your question. Uh, we will address all questions at the end. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Concrete Ontario YouTube channel. Um, and to make it easier for all attendees, we will send a copy of the presentation in PDF format and a link to the YouTube video. Uh, it will be emailed to all participants at the end of the webinar. Now your presenter, we'll get right into it, uh, is Joe Lynch. Joe is the uh, Senior Vehicle Standards Engineer and Team Leader uh, for Vehicle Weights and Dimensions for the Ministry of Transportation. Joe has a Bachelor of Engineering Sciences in Mechanical Engineering. Um, he attended Northwestern University um, for Center for Public Safety and became a certified accident investigator and reconstructionist. Um, Joe spent eight years in engineering consulting, investigating and reconstructing automobile accidents, and uh, he was mostly involved in heavy trucks. And Joe's been uh, over nine years with the MTO. So good morning, Joe. Thank you very much for helping us out this morning. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing very well. I hope everyone else can say the same. Perfect. Um, I'm just going to make you the presenter and um, we'll kick this off uh, right now. Here we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I hope. Yeah, looks good. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so my name is engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer, not a civil engineer. I'm not always the best at answering any questions around pavement and bridges, um, but I can talk about trucks. Um, this, uh, this up is, it is a, a pretty lengthy um, sort of workshop you know two hours sort of thing um, sometimes two and a half hours including Q&A um, but what I've done is I've reduced it down to uh, slides that are not really relevant to this relevant to this audience you're going to notice that, that I'm not going to be speaking directly to this file will be shared with you um, as a PDF uh, basically provide this entire deck to you guys. Um, you have my contact information, so if you want to follow up on anything specific, uh, we can do that. Um, there's your safety division, which is going to have a new name very soon. There yet, but uh, um, but that being said, this is the presentation is going to give you a general overview of material vehicle weights and dimensions uh, for safe production. Vehicle. So it's OREG 413.05. Um, the like really high level overview, lots of detail, but I'm not going to speak to everything in there. This is and how we rolled it out, uh, the grandfathering regime, and then compliance and some of the stuff that you guys need to know. Need to know. At the very back, um, there's some recent amendments um, that speak to not so much uh, ready mix trucks themselves, uh, but some of the other stuff that we've been putting into play. Um, and so essentially, this is where we started. Um, 
back in the 1970s, we had uh, we, we we basically determined the Ontario Bridge Formula. The Ontario Bridge Formula. What we did was we looked at all, all the bridges across all of Ontario and looked at the maximum allowable weights we could allow, and that's what gave us our maximum weight in the Highway Traffic Act that has not changed since then. Uh, it's roughly 140,000 pounds, 63,500 kg. Um, but back then, uh, there was no real control of vehicle configurations. We had overall length limit, and then we had axle weight um, limits. Um, but then essentially what happened was, as we rolled through the 70s and 80s, we had the introduction of uh, lift axles and rigid lift axles, and you know the more axles meant more weight. But then at the same time, when we got to the 90s, we started to look at things like roads and bridges, um, 96 through 2000. Um, looking at roads and bridges and seeing, wow, we have a lot of excessive damage to roads and bridges. Um, obviously, that's a function of that infrastructure. Um, when we started to look back at other things around lift axles, we found that there was a bunch of um, links between lift axle equipped vehicles, especially with, uh, you know, the more lift axles, essentially, uh, the higher rate of uh, or higher risk for collision uh, based on the collision rates that we were seeing. So way back then, <clears throat> uh, essentially, uh, when the Harris government was in, um, they embarked on a regulatory reform project um, to try and get hold of our vehicle weights and dimensions laws. So essentially, in the 80s and 90s, people talked about lift axles. Uh, there was at one point in time, uh, something sitting in front of a minister saying we should ban lift axles because of the damage to our roads and bridges. Um, that wasn't going to go over well. Um, so in, in the late 90s, essentially, we kicked off this four phase gradual migration uh, toward like towards vehicle productive and infrastructure. And so right now, uh, as of July 1st, 2011, all four phases have been implemented and, and we're almost through the entire regime. It is the uh, final grandfathering for phase four. Um, and then we're going to be living in from now we're going to be living in a world where there's a uh, spiff and non-spiff vehicles that are in operation and what i'm showing at the bottom here is that in a regulation you're going to notice boxes on them and those gray boxes uh, essentially mean that there's a body there we don't care what kind of body it is um, the regulation is not specific to any sort of commodity or body type um, at, on a go forward basis. Essentially, once we're in that spiff versus non spiff world, for grandfathering, it does key for you guys to appreciate. But when you look at um, really weights and dimensions, and not really so much what the body type is. So, that any body type that's out there, or if it's a garbage truck. And so, you know, we did, we undertook this ambitious overhaul of the. Uh, starting in the 90s, we kind of sort of uh, led towards uh, the safe, productive, infrastructure-friendly vehicle platform where we vehicles operating on the road, something that uh, maximized weight capacities across the entire regime so we could give the most productive vehicles and the most flexibility there, while also trying to protect our infrastructure investments and our investments in roads and bridges. Um, you know, some of the strict design standards that we put in place has to do with vehicle stability and controllability, um, trying to increase operation. The way we did that was by putting all of these performance measures. Uh, this is something that Ontario was actually the last to employ the use of dynamic performance measures towards regulatory reforms. Uh, we had been doing uh, a brief period of time before we implemented uh, for regulatory reform. Um, however, all other jurisdictions have been using it since uh, the mid 90s. And so essentially what we're, our goal was, was to do less damage to infrastructure um, and try and tackle the safety issues that we were seeing on road. So, you know, you, you, a lot of people in community will talk from rigid fi uh, fixed lift axles to uh, self steer um, lift axle controls being removed from the vehicle, essentially road deployment whenever there's lift axles involved. Um, proper distribution of weight, uh, because that does mean something to vehicle stability. Um, you know, properly distributing between truck and trailer is something that uh, is very important as well when it comes to 
Um, and essentially what we were trying to do is use those performance targets to ensure stability, controllability, and reduce risk of rollovers and jackknives. Um, what we did foremost was uh, to maintain at least similar um, payloads and where we could increase payloads um, and in some cases increase dimensional criteria as well. And so that's where uh, we move from to 53s in the beginning. Um, you know, now B trains are even longer than they were when we first implemented them. Um, but that's where we've been going with the SPIF regime. Now, when I talk about dynamic performance and safety, what I talk about are these. Some of people refer to them as the RTAC standards. Some of them, some people refer to them as the CCMTA standards because it's kind of sort of the same group. Um, but really what we're talking about here are evaluating upon thresholds for um, you know, various different uh, maneuvers that a truck would uh, typically uh, on a normal journey down the road. High speed off tracking turn is like your long banking corner across Highway 17 at 80 kilometers an hour. And the fact that the trailer will outswing uh, compared to the tractor. The vehicle's not into the adjacent lanes, um, you know, and the same thing with transient off tracking. We're measuring where a vehicle's doing 100 kilometers an hour and making a lane change and how much trailer sway you have. Uh, yes, these show pictures of tractor semi trailers. It's the exact same analysis for a truck or a truck trailer configuration. Um, and all of these have thresholds, and we allow them to sometimes float over those thresholds while also appreciating that sometimes when you let transfer ratio float over, it will sometimes improve other things like, um, like your low speed turns, um, lateral friction utilization and things like that. So um, it's about a balance on safety here and trying to maintain uh, the critical measures of dynamic performance, uh, you know, typically high speed turns uh, being the most critical. Um, low speed turns are just as important. That's why we're showing this in the bottom corner because we obviously don't want trucks, truck trailers and tractor semi trailers, you know, driving over curbs and uh, taking out light standards and whatnot. It's about, you know, making sure that those vehicles fit in the road. And so right now, like I was saying, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're almost complete when this kind of trans, when we talk about the transition here. We've been just looking at phase three vehicles. Um, that were uh, grandfathered, um, you know, they just, uh, they went through uh, extended grandfathering via permit starting in 2015. And we're starting to see that uh, there's less and less of those permitted vehicles on the road now. Um, the transition towards fit vehicles is rather healthy. Um, now we're dealing with phase four. So this is a, an entirely new thing, but come 2026, when all of the permits are um, offline and those vehicles are, are passed through vintage, this is what the world's gonna look like. You're gonna have either a SPIF vehicle and you're gonna fit into the SPIF regime or you're not. And when you are not, then you're gonna be held to axle weights per HTA, which are pretty much the same um, as what we see in SPIF. Dimensions per HTA, which means in certain configurations uh, that were dealt with in phase two and three, for instance, uh, you wouldn't be uh, allowed the say 25 meter long B train, um, 27 and a half uh, meter long B train, you're stuck in the 23 meter B train that was allowed back in, uh, you know, back before the regulatory reforms. Now gross weights, that's another thing, because what we've done with non-spit vehicles is try to maintain their safety as well via dynamic performance. Um, and so we looked at how we could tackle that. Um, and essentially, like I said, gross weights is where the reduction comes in. So you do have a weight reduction, well, gross. Um, if you meet the allowable gross, you're not typically gonna be exceeding axle weights unless you can. Um, but you know, for you guys, not typically. Um, now, <clears throat> it, it is a weight reduction though, and I will explain that later. Right now though, this is the world that we're living in. Um, right now, when it comes is the vehicle SPIF compliant? Well, for phase four vehicles that were built before July 1st, 2011, uh, most likely the answer is no. Um, and then our gross weights, you know, that basically it's a, um, this to determine where you sit when it comes to grandfathering. And now as of the end of this year, I'm gonna, um, 
uh, we're going to be looking at permits, obviously, uh, going forward because the end of initial grandfathering is going to be coming to an end. Through this chart, you'll notice that essentially, if you're spiff, you're spiff, you're good all day. And we and weights that match the, the criteria. And if you match the criteria, then you have in the schedule. If you're non-SPIF, um, you're either going to be declared non-SPIF or you're grandfathered. And if you are grandfathered, then you're going to end up with a permit and you can work your way down. You're not an A from the other 29 gross weight tables uh, that, are, that we have positioned in the regulation, but it's actually a direct reflection of the old section 118. So essentially, keep on maintaining business at this weight regime. Now, table 32 is for non-spiff uh, gross weights, and you can see that what I'm trying to show here is that your base length is your actual base length from the lead axle to the trailing axle, center to center, and then the number of axles down. Um, so, for instance, there are trucks out there that have rigid lift axles. Um, you know, I've had many people call and say, "I want to operate non-spiff. I'm not going to upgrade my." going to continue moving and these are ready mixed trucks as well um, operating in the Windsor area and a recent conversation they said you know we're, we just want to see what it looks like if we were to carry on moving this uh, or using this equipment um, obviously it's more beneficial if they keep that rigid lift axle down because you're going to get more weight than having three axles right so um, but you'll notice going across this that there is a weight reduction um, on gross compared to what you would previously be allowed to operate and again, it's just the number of and so a general overview of how to uh, uh, to grandfathering. It's directly related to how we actually um, rolled out the regulation itself. And so in phase one, really all we dealt with was a switch from standard tractor semi-trailer lengths at uh, 53 foot. And then in 2003, that's where we started to tackle. Um, really, based on the evidence that we had received um, that I spoke to previously in the 90s about damage to pavement and bridges and road safety. And so the first uh, group of vehicles on road that we dealt with were dump semi-trailers. That was phase three. 2003 were way, uh, there's a grandfathering regime for anybody who's interested. Um, by and by, uh, you know, in in time, we don't see as many end dumps and open top hoppers as we do walking floors nowadays. Um, well, walking floor was actually dealt with here. Um, three, in phase three, we rolled out uh, multi-axle semi-trailers and doubles. And as I was in saying before, they were grandfathered till December 13th, uh, December 31st, 2015, excuse me. We rolled out permits in the fall of 2015, around September 2015. Um, what we're seeing now on the back end uh, is that as grandfathering is running out, uh, you know, basically there's a lot less non-spiff or pre-spiff vehicles that are out there as they're, they've run out of grandfathering uh, for the most part. Uh, we also dealt with specialized tanker semi-trailers, but these are your really high-end uh, cryogenic tankers and things like that um, and other bulk semi-trailers. Those are all running out of grandfathering at the end of this year. Um, we gave them a different uh, a sort of separate uh, regime uh, when it came to grandfathering um, when we rolled these guys out um, but they have a hard stop and no uh, permit extension now phase four which is the most interesting to our mixer trucks on the road and the ready mix operators here um, so this was rolled out july 1st pardon me again july 1st 2011 um, and this dealt with trucks truck trailers um, buses motorhomes uh, slash RVs. And you'll see that concrete mixers, we did give uh, an initial grandfathering, or sorry, a uh, an extended grandfathering uh, up till 20 years of age for the trucks on the road. Um, all others are uh, up to 15 years uh, of age. So dump trucks, uh, for instance, would be 15 years, but if you're a mixer, uh, you're 20. Um, so essentially what it means is at the end of this year, December 31st, 2020, you'll have a permit on board your truck if your truck is under 20 years of age. And that truck will take you all the way to the end of your 20 year grandfathering period. Uh, it is a one-time permit, a single permit, based on the VIN of the vehicle. 
So it sticks with that vehicle. If you sell that vehicle, it is completely transferable with the vehicle to the new owner because we're not tying it to CVOR. So it doesn't mean um, you need to, uh, you know, the, the new owner would need to, uh, to get himself his own permit. It stays with the vehicle and it is for the life of the permit. So if it's, you know, if you're, if you're getting five extra years of grandfathering under that permit, it's a one-time purchase. There's no annual or new fees or anything like that. Right now, it is a cost of $440. I do not believe um, that we will be raising that price uh, coming into this fall. Um, you know, internally speaking on some of our measures that we have in place just in, with respect to this pandemic, uh, I cannot foresee this government ever choosing to raise permit prices in the near term. Um, so that is something that's very positive for us moving forward. We know what the price is going to be when it comes fall. Now fall, what's going to happen is we will have permits on our, on, uh, our typical NGO permit website. Like if you were to Google um, NGO permits, you're going to be brought to the OO permitting website. That's what it comes up in the title bar, but technically it's all permits. And if you scroll down, you're going to see grandfathering permits uh, for SPIF and uh, eventually, uh, come fall, hopefully during the summer, we're going to have the permits for phase four available. Now, I wanted to hit that before I talked about truck and trailer combinations, because this is the idiosyncrasy in the regulation. If you have a truck and you're operating a truck and a trailer combination, there is going to be a situation in most cases where you have a spiff truck and a grandfathered trailer or a grandfathered truck and a spiff compliant trailer. In both of those cases, if one of those vehicles is permitted to be grandfathered to the previous regime, then the entire vehicle is treated as grandfathered. So even if you have a SPIF compliant truck ahead of a non-SPIF grandfathered trailer, you're gonna be back in the old regime uh, based on much of a difference for most people out there, not much. Um, it's going to give you uh, the same sort of axle weight allowances and technically the same gross weight allowances, um, especially when it comes to uh, uh, some of the vehicles that are operating out there. The only difference that there would be um, is when it comes to twin steers and how we implemented twin steers um, with trailers. And I'll get a bit into that in the coming slides here. But I just wanted to hit on that because it is kind of an interesting way that we've had to deal with this uh, truck and trailer combination thing. And another thing I, uh, that's very important to consider is that hitch offset length, we put into place if we implemented hitch offset length at 1.8 meters, which is the same as every other province in Canada. And there was a lot of science behind that. And uh, we've maintained that in the stiff regime. However, when it comes to grandfathered vehicles, if your stiff truck needs a longer hitch offset because the trailer not actually the trailer doesn't uh, suffice uh, for that then that's where your gimme is for the grandfather period um, if there's no trip there it doesn't matter because there's nothing hooked up to that hitch so we ignore that measurement entirely in your spiff 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 truck spiff trailer where it really matters and uh, okay. Um, the overall. So any other vehicle that's out there, grandfathering has ended. There, um, you know, there were some vehicles that were out there that were kind of sort of oddball configurations and they will not be granted. So in the end, what did we result in? We resulted in 31 different spiff configurations, everything from your fixed axle uh, standard uh, tractor semi-trailer, five, six axle sort of deal, all the way up through. We have our five, six uh, axle semi-trailers that we really can't operate anywhere else in Canada except for Ontario. However, they are very versatile and do really great work. Uh, Michigan, uh, we have tri drives and lots of tri drive um, tractor semi-trailers. Um, we're starting to see in different locations now, um, specifically tri drive self steer quads and stuff operating in forestry. Um, how people do business in that regard. Um, A trains, B trains, and C trains are pretty much the same as they used to be, um, except for we did amend a few years ago to allow longer B trains. Um, so they're up to 27 and a half meters, and you're allowed long wheelbase tractors on them now. Um, we vehicles like the hinge semi trailer which is really dedicated to forestry and there's only about six operating in the province 
um, and then you'll see the trucks. And so phase four starts at right here at uh, 16, uh, where we have our buses, a city bus, uh, inner city bus, which is essentially a coach or any of those double deckers you see your you see operating in the, some of the bigger cities. And then you have your standard trucks and then lift axle trip quick trucks, and then your twin steers and, and multi-axles, and then trailers. Saddle mounts uh, or drive-away combinations, whatever way you want to speak to them. Uh, they were the last uh, configuration that we, uh, that we added uh, in phase four. And so essentially, this is what the regulation looks like. If you go online, it's actually a lot more messy than it used to. Um, however, we do have a guidebook and Alan has a copy of the guidebook. We will be sharing that. Um, there's a new guidebook that we released last summer. Um, but essentially what I'm trying to show here is how you read the regulation. And so this is just an example. This could be a twin steer truck, doesn't matter. Schedule three is what I'm looking at. We're a self steer quad semi trailer. And essentially what you need to do is read through the combination, read through the schedule itself and look at the configuration description looking at. Then you have to look at any qualifying preconditions. So for this vehicle, for instance, it has a self-steer axle. So there's some labeling requirements around labeling the vehicle as being spiff. There's also some requirements around load equalization between that self-steer and the, and the axles. If you meet all the qualifying preconditions and the description of the vehicle, then you move to the dimension chart. And if you meet those dimensional criteria, you are a spiff legal combination. Now you can look at the weights that you are allowed to employ in the weight limit chart corresponding. So that's how you're supposed to read the schedule. If you go to e-laws right now, it is kind of a nightmare because we went through what's called AOTA compliance. So E-reader, it works awesome. Um, and you can listen to it read to you, but if you try and read and decipher yourself, it can be challenging, which is why we maintain this guidebook. It's a little bit um, easier for people to digest. And so when you're reading the SPIF regulation, this is going to be the interesting part is trying to determine your weights and where you sit. And so with a SPIF 19, this is your typical, um, you know, single axle straight truck. Uh, we allow 9,000 kg allowable on the steer axle of any trucks in Ontario. Um, it's 7,700 on a tractor semi-trailer, 9,000 on a truck. And then we allow 10,000 on, um, on uh, sorry, <clears throat> on all other axles. And so you'll see, for instance, this fifth 19, you, you can get up to 9,000 plus up to 10,000 on the single, and that'll give you 19,000 kg maximum gross. Um, with a SPIF 20, what I'm showing here is the difference between a widespread tandem like basically a 72 inch tandem spread on the drives and a 60 inch. Give you is on a widespread tandem, we will give you 19,100 kg. There's more allowable weight when you, be, uh, when you use the widespread tandem. Um, it does result in a longer chassis and, and a larger truck. Give you that extra 1100 kg. And the SPIF 24, very similarly, we're gonna have a tightly sped, uh, spread tri drive. And in regulation, it is a true tri drive. But when it's tightly spread, we can only give you 21, three, uh, sorry, 21,300 kg. But when it's a widespread tritum, we can give you 22,000. There's reasons for that. And it's mostly uh, based on our bridge joists and our bridge law and how, uh, how that determines whether or not our bridges like the weight or not. Enough, uh, the joists don't take such a beating. Therefore, we can give you a little bit more weight without doing any more damage to those bridges. The main thing that we need to consider when we're looking at trucks is that we do have a minimum steer axle weight. Uh, we've had a minimum steer axle weight in almost all other Canadian jurisdictions except for Ontario, and we employed this when we brought SPIF in. And so for SPIF 19, you'll see that you need a minimum of 30% on your steer axle. And um, for a 20, it's a 21%, and for a 24, it's a 23% minimum. And that's percentage of gross. Now, when you're looking at your truck, though, you also have to consider this when you're looking at your allowable gross. These weights that I'm showing you are theoretical weights. When we actually enforce the law, it's the steer axle weight plus the allowables on the other axle. That's what determines your maximum gross. It's written that way in regulation. 
um, because essentially if you're not hitting 9,000, if you're only hitting 8,000 kg on that SPF 19 in the top rear, that's 18,000. You're going to be good with the 30,000 uh, gross, but you're only allowed up to the 18,000 maximum because you only have eight on the steer. So this is the most important part for most of the folks that are in this uh, webinar, because most of the folks in this webinar have been operating tandem steer trucks for a while now, some before SPIF came in and uh, some because of SPIF. Um, they're interesting configurations and I'd love to see them. Um, now there is some idiosyncrasies with respect to weight limits and it's very similar to what I was discussing on the previous slide. And it has to do with employing widespread versus tightly spread tandems and tritums and giving you the more allowable weight. Um, there's also an idiosyncrasy when it comes to the SPIF 22 on a short wheelbase chassis and reducing the maximum gross weight. It's set out in the regulation. There's some verbiage there speaking to it. But essentially what we're saying is with a tightly spread um, front and a tightly spread rear, it's 17 and 17. That gets you a 35,000 um, allowable gross. Um, if you spread the rears and the fronts, then you get 18 plus 19, one. However, if it's a short team a sh um, truck, then you end up with 32. Um, it's, it, it seems a lot more complicated than it is when I show it this way, I think. Um, but in regulation, um, most people aren't going to be landing into the short wheelbase world, especially in the ready-mix truck world. Um, but the key is this, you must have 38% of gross uh, vehicle weight at all times. And with a ready-mix truck, kind of, it's not as difficult to, to deal with um, because you guys have pretty much a, a, a standard point load uh, CG sort of location uh, that gets you to these weights. But the key is if you're going to be pulling a trailer behind a twin steer, uh, twin steer tandem drive, there are restrictions when you're pulling a trailer. And that goes back to the 32,000 as well. And there's reasons for that, and it has to do with the dynamic performance of the vehicle. And we did just complete a regulatory review uh, over the past two years where a consultant actually dug into this to look further into their previous calculations and surmisings on, on trailer and uh, truck when it comes to a twin steer. And they came to the exact same conclusion as they did previously, uh, was that there are detriments to dynamic performance. Essentially, it's different than, it, it's different than when you have a tri drive. Uh, because when you have a tri drive, um, you know, the easiest way to say is that the back end is more sticky. So it's holding that vehicle to the road better and giving you more control so you can maintain the highest weights possible. So when you're running a, a, a tandem steer tri drive truck, albeit you need the 23% up front, it's a little bit less than the 20, uh, SPIF 22, um, but there's no reduction when it comes to trailer weight. So you'll see the widespread tritum, you'll get some weight. Uh, you know, you'll get up to 40,000 kg because we're using the widespread tandem, uh, tritum and the widespread tandem on the front. If you were to pull a full trailer behind that, then you're getting the exact same weights as the D trains that are operating on road, which is bridge law, 140,000 pounds, 63,500 kg. And now remember how I said that we only show gray bodies. And so I stole this slide from something that I gave from uh, to our red, our excuse me, our uh, aggregate and earth moving folks. Um, but again, these are just gray bodies. It looks like a dump. That could be anything else on board. Um, there's not very many folks on this call, I believe, that are going to be running triaxle trucks. Um, not very many ready mix trucks being built on a SPIF 23 chassis nowadays. SPIF 21 is not going to get too much weight. This is more of our Quebec based truck. Um, where we have a liftable self steer or a forced steer axle. It's not a twin steer, it is a forced steer, a um, little bit different. Um, these are really Quebec based trucks that we introduced in Ontario just for the border crossing. For the most part, what we see in Ontario is the SPIF 23s. And very similar as to, uh, to what I was explaining before with the 23 um, with the longer wheelbase and a widespread tandem, you're going to get more weight. Um, the key to these vehicles is also that you do require mandatory minimums on the front. And there are rules around when that axle can be deployed. And so you're going to see that the axle can only be, be deployed if it sees a certain amount of weight. That's true in all cases in the SPIF world. 
unless you're operating in reduced load period. When you're operating in a reduced load period, you are allowed to have an external switch to drop that axle to take on more weight, even if you're not going to see the 4,000, because you're trying to meet that five, and that'll give you the extra weight during a reduced load period. Um, not, you're never going to hit gross, uh, but you're going to at least be able to operate with a little bit more weight and not have to maintain that uh, lift axle in the air. And so, after we get through all of our trucks, now we have our trailers. And we have a few different trailer types. Some of them are very similar. Uh, SPIF 23, oh, sorry, SPIF 26 and SPIF 30 that I'm showing you right now are very similar trailers. Now, the key to understanding pulling trailers is this. We have trailer tables, tables 30 and 31. So when you're looking at the trailer schedules in SPIF, you're gonna notice that it says go to table 30 or 31, depending on what your configuration looks like. And we're gonna have axle minimums in some cases. So for this 26 and 30, there's no axle minimums. As long as it's a SPIF truck, any SPIF truck, it can pull this trailer and these are the weights you're going to get, whether it's a single axle, tandem axle, or a tridem axle. And your gross weight, um, and then again, the spreads, the, the wider the spread, the more weight you're gonna get. The gross weights on table 30 um, and 31, you're gonna see that uh, it sets out, um, you know, depending on what the schedule points you towards, it's gonna point you towards, you know, looking at these tables, you're gonna be able to draw based on base length, very similar to a non-spiff, and the number of axles, what you can carry gross. And so this is an example of one where we have the three axle minimum. So only a truck with three axles or more can pull a SPIF 27 or SPIF 29 trailer. And so if the axles all load equalize, these are the weights you're gonna be allowed on the self steer and then on the tandem or the versus the nine widespread tandem. Now the gross weight tables, again, they're pointing you to table 30 on this case. And so you're gonna see what the weight limits are very similar to the previous trailer. And then you're starting to get into the full trailers. And the SPIF 28 is the big one. Um, you know, you need three, uh, four, uh, three or four axle trucks to pull this vehicle, uh, this trailer, regardless of the number of axles on the trailer itself. Um, but you're going to see, like, you know, you're going to tandem, two tandem axles, um, you know, 18,000 on the tandems. Um, there's not much more to give on this vehicle. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you have eight axles down and you're pulling it with a uh, adequate amount of axles essentially you're going to get 63 500 63 and so that's kind of sort of telling you where you could land depending on what kind of configuration type you have and uh you know that you can hit the maximum weights in ontario in a truck trailer configuration just as much as a double trip so as i was speaking to you before we do have our vehicle weights and dimensions guidebook um, we did re do a re-release, uh, you're going to see some new photos in there. We have a nice ready mix truck right on the cover. And now when inside the work, excuse me, inside the uh, guidebook, we have a section of worksheets and examples. Now the worksheets, you know, you're, you're going to see here right in the, in the uh, middle of the page, it says AG gross vehicle weight worksheet. And this is for essentially yourselves weights you are allowed on your configuration and so for this it's a you know a, a widespread tandem axle vehicle it's a, a tandem drive and so you're saying okay schedule i'm going to look at this description you're going to read the description it's going to say you know tandem steer tandem drive um so that puts you into spec schedule 22 and so you know you're good for 18,000. And you know, you know in your tandem rears because they're widespread, you're good for 19.1. Technically, that adds up to uh, 27.100, or sorry, 37.100. Um, and then when you go limit chart for the allowable gross weight, it's the same sort of thing, a maximum allowable. And so you end up with the lowest case of one or the other, which is the same number. Essentially, what we're showing here is that at the end of the day, you uh, are allowed 37,100 kg on this vehicle. Now you're going to note there's a note at the very bottom of the page in this box here, though. Um, if this truck is pulling a trailer, that you're going to be limited to 3,200 kg on this truck. Um, and so that's where we stand on that. 
Um, so we have these worksheets, um, you know, page 134 is a SPIF compliant uh, four axle truck, twin steer. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones in, that are in there, but then you can also do this yourself because what we provide the worksheets in there as well. And so for me, this is my contact for information for anybody that needs to contact me. Um, I, I'm on a one phone line system. So that's my cell phone line. I have no desk line. Um, and so that's how you, uh, whenever I'm available. And then in the back end, I show you some of the other examples of the worksheets and things we've been doing. And also um, attached to this, you're gonna see some of the other changes that we've made um, to the regulatory regimes over the past few years. Uh, not much hitting on what you guys operate. Obviously, you're not pulling boats on uh, on stinger steers, but uh, we did make some changes in the past year. And so that's all gonna be reflected in that guidebook. And so now I'm looking at my time and it's we're 40 minutes in. And so, thank you, Joe. Uh, we, we do have some questions, uh, so I'll just take over. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is, let me just pull it up here. So in terms of uh, grandfathering, can you obtain the, the permit online or do you actually have to visit a service Ontario center? Oh no, these permits will be available online and they'll be downloadable. Um, you can either print it and fill it in by hand or you can just type it right in. Now, that's how we usually set up the PDFs or our forms people do. You'll be able to submit that directly to our permit office via email. Now, the key to this is that do not put information in those emails because we'll immediately delete it and uh it from our system we won't have the ability to reply to it thanks to our our, our it's really good laws around what we're doing here because we don't have anything late so essentially there's a you, you'll put your application form in um you can uh, submit it online or to the uh, email and have in, hopefully it'll just be through a portal and then that will come back and ask you to submit a payment form, which you can submit via fax, or you can actually call and submit the information that way, similar to we, um, you know, all the credit card companies. Those permits would be then, depending on how you move to you, a lot of people are actually going for the electronic version now, which makes sense. Um, and so it'll be forwarded to you in your email for you to print and print that. Okay, so it sounds a like a pretty easy process. Now, next question, um, what are some of the repercussions if you don't obtain a permit in time? I know we have lots of time, but let's say you, you choose not to get a permit in time. Well, you're gonna be treated as non -spit. So you're gonna be treated as if your grandfathering has lapsed. And if you're treated as non spiff and you don't meet the SPIF criteria, like there are some twin steer trucks out there, for instance, that already meet the SPIF criteria. And so they're already in the SPIF world and people don't even know it because they're not looking at their vehicle and they're the way that they could. Um, you know, you're looking at a twin steer tandem drive truck and you look at the dimensions in SPIF and you say, oh yeah, I am actually, I fit into the regime. It. Require permits though. Um, and you're not grandfathered or you don't have not got your permit. If you do get non spiff and if you're non spiff you're in table 32. If you're in table 32 it gets ugly real quick because now you're over on allowable gross and it can be by a substantial amount right and if you're talking anywhere between overweight that's a substantial amount of money um, that you're going to be looking at in fines. Uh, it doesn't look the greatest on your CBOR either. Yeah for sure. This is a very specific question. Uh, it says the WB dimension on SPIF 22 was set at six meters. Um, now they're saying every twin steer truck built before 2011 falls approximately 5% short of that six meters. Uh, the industry has been running six meters on a shorter wheelbase for nine years now. It, it, there's no difference in driving characteristics. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any way that that six meters could be changed to 5.75 meters? 
Uh, interestingly enough, during our SPIF review that we just completed, the regulatory review, uh, our engineers or the engineers that we can, the consultants that we hired actually did look at that. Um, we did look at a few different things. We looked at the the longer wheelbase, and we also looked at a tighter um, a tighter tandem because we knew that those vehicles were out there. A question: the previous analysis that we had done we opened up and said this, and unfortunately. When it comes to dynamic performance, um, and so, and then that also speaks to some other issues that we have when it comes to pavement and bridges. Maintain the balance there. Um, they uh, essentially said no. Um, was deployed in 2011 is it should remain consistent, and so we've moved forward with that. So you know you will be. Um, but no, um, going forward, we don't see an amendment to the regime around those types of vehicles and the dimensions specifically set out. Okay. And uh, we have one final question. Obviously, with everything that's going on with COVID-19, um, you know, we are trying to bring in new drivers into the industry. Um, do you have any idea when the drive test facilities will be opened up? Oh, that's a tough one, guys. Um, like I, I can say this. I am part of some of these committees that are having a, um, all of these different discussions internally. A lot of it is not public, and you can tell that our premier Doug Forty has done a fantastic job. I can't see anything about this government and the way that we, they've reacted and worked with the feds and all of this stuff. Um, you know, but even Doug Ford, you know, talking about tomorrow. Um, it's out in the public, so I can say it, that, you know, tomorrow the plan is to discuss uh, phase one, phase two reopening. Um, it kind of sort of sets some pr parameters out. But you'll note his hesitation and even saying that, you know, albeit tomorrow's good news, I'm not going to come out and say today whether or not tomorrow will will actually land on a date for anything opening. And that's really the reality that we're living in. Um, you know, like when we keep on looking at the numbers for COVID and the community spread is really the, the big issue that we're worried about, right? Um, so far we've maintained, you know, we've had, but then at the same time, those numbers, you know, just yesterday, all of a sudden we get a little blip in the middle. And, um, you know, when we see employees at like a Walmart and, uh, and, uh, and another one of the Loblaws that are contracting um, COVID, you know, that kind of sort of sets us back because it means we're in a community transmission sort of safe phase. It's not something that's isolated to hospitals or isolated to nursing homes. And so right now, it really is murky. Um, it's murky at any level of government. And, uh, you know, even the premier will say that it's murky for him because, I mean, these are some really hard decisions to make. And, uh, you know, as many, you know, we can go three or four days with really decent looking numbers or even good looking numbers. And then one day. And so, you know, we're hoping we know mostly specifically uh, the driver issue. Uh, but there's a, a lot of drivers out there that are also unemployed right now. But I mean, these get into a, a concrete mixer um, any day tomorrow. Um, so we totally. And, uh, you know, we'd like to get these things open as well. Um, even maintaining Service Ontario right now has been a great difficulty, um, you know, for like new plates for vehicles. Uh, you recognize you can't just get plates easily. You actually have to go to a Service Ontario. Um, and in this case, when we're going to be able to open up any sort of those things, um, you know, what we've looked at under phase one and phase two, we're going to talk about, or Doug Ford will be, uh, our premier will be releasing something tomorrow. Um, and it is likely to speak to functions uh, because those are functions uh, that we need to maintain order in the province as well as accelerate uh, our opening going forward. Um, you know, if we have new vehicles that are out there that uh, we can't get plates on, if we have drivers out there that can't get a license, I mean, these are all really important things. Um, and so I appreciate the question. Um, but uh, I cannot give you a definitive answer either way. 
Yeah, fair enough. There's, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty with everything that's going on. Um, that's all the questions um, we have. Uh, again, thank you, Joe, very much uh, for helping us out. Uh, you are the expert in this field, and we will forward any other questions to you. Um, you provided a great overview today, and again, I just want to thank you. No, not a problem. And so what I will do, Alan, is I will provide this in PDF form to you right after I get off of this uh, webinar, and I will also make sure so that all 41 people who have attended can uh, can have access to this. And if you wanted to uh, pass it out to any of the other members that missed, uh, I have no problem with that either. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of upcoming webinars, um, so June 4th, we do have a little bit of a different format for a webinar. We have a panel, uh, meaning uh, we're going to be talking about recruiting, training, and engaging ready mix drivers. Uh, the panel will just be taking questions and providing guidance to members on you know, how to recruit, train, and engage ready mix drivers, especially now. Um, so that webinar registration, registration is available. And, um, we'll be going out in the next few days. So again, thank you very much to Joe. Thank you very much to everybody tuning in this morning. And hopefully you can join us on the next webinar. Um, have a great day.